Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. For many years, DDT was considered to be a popular chemical. It was used to control insect pests on crops and forest lands around homes, gardens, as well as industrial and commercial purposes. Today, a new family of chemicals called neonicotinoid pesticides are even more toxic than DDT and are polluting the earth with even more deadly consequences. On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk to former EPA analyst, Dr. Evangelos Valianatos, who's going to talk about DDT and why it took so long to ban it. So first, I'd like to welcome to the show my special guest co-host, Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, June. It's a pleasure to be back. And our guest today, Dr. Evangelos Valianatos. Good afternoon, sir, and welcome to the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Valianatos, could you please share with our listeners a little bit about yourself and your tenure with the EPA? Okay. I First of all, with my education, I got a zoology degree, and then I got a doctor's degree in history, and then I did postdoctoral studies in the history of science. And with that background, I ended up working, starting uh, to work for the, for the U.S. EPA in 1979. I was there for 25 years, and during 25 years, uh, I did a number of things, and I learned a lot, and I got uh, sometimes happy, sometimes very happy, but overall, the experience was not very pleasant. It was not pleasant because I, I noticed a lot of things not going correct or right, or as I had hoped that it would go. And it was not just my feeling, but the feeling of many of my colleagues who also felt very unhappy about the, the movement in the government to cooperate much more with the, with the so-called regulated industry rather than uh, do what by law we were supposed to do, that is to protect human health and the environment from tremendous number of pollutants, including, of course, DDT. In that process, uh, my colleagues would give me a lot of their own memoranda and other documents that they themselves wrote up in order to convince their superiors they had to do something about the crisis, and then develop a small library of documents. And out of those documents, I eventually wrote this book, Poison Spring, which is really the first history of what EPA and the and therefore the industry are doing together to maintain the status quo, which is, of course, to all of us, very much unacceptable because of what it does to wildlife, honeybees in particular, and to us as human beings. Recently, you published an article in independentsciencenews.org that was titled Ruthless Power and Deleterious Politics from DDT to Roundup. Could you share with our listeners the history of DDT? DDT uh, was invented in late 19th century and eventually was put to use as an insecticide in uh, around the years of World War II. Uh, it was, uh, in fact, its inventor, uh, a chemist, got the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1947. Um, this, uh, and then EPA, of course, they came to the United States and it was approved by the USDA in 1945. EPA did not exist down to 1970. So DDT started its career as a kind of a war chemical because it was used against malaria mosquitoes. And indeed, the armies of both the United States and Europe, they used the chemical to disinfect, or, or to, to do many, many things to the, to, the work, to the soldiers that were coming back from the front. 
And with that kind of glory of World War II and, you know, the blowing of the atomic weapons above ground and uh, the climate and the political reality was that of exuberance towards any kind of technology. And uh, indeed, last night I watched a documentary on the use of nuclear bombs, and that immediately brought to me the, in my face the whole idea of the DDT. There was simply not much attention paid to what these chemicals did to the natural world and to, to our health. To the natural world, there was practically no, no attention whatsoever because if you create a nuclear bomb that destroys so much, then it's very, you don't have much time to think about insects or <laughs> about the, the so-called effects of these chemicals. And DDT was approved with that kind of political and social philosophy. It was like a golden bullet ready to do for the farmer what it had done to malaria mosquitoes and to the, to the soldiers. So it was used, had to put it carelessly all over the country. And as a result, it began to cause tremendous uh, adverse effects. There was a wonderful physician in Connecticut, uh, Morton Biskind, who noticed that both domestic animals and humans began to to get all sorts of maladies that were very much related to DDT. He brought this to the attention of the authorities and he noticed complete disregard. And indeed, he published an article, his article in 1953, and he listed the number of maladies that were caused by DDT and his dismay, of course, with the kind of political reaction to his suggestions. And it was almost done, we had to wait down to 1972 when EPA, just a little bit less than two years old, eventually decided to ban DDT because of its effects on birds. Uh, it was wiping out so many insects that, first of all, birds would starve to death, or even more likely, they could not reproduce because the eggs were very fragile. And the mother bird or the father bird could not um, stay on the eggs and expect the eggs to come up with a live a young. So eventually EPA did ban it in 1972, but the deciding factor was not what it did to the birds or to wildlife, but it was because they had classified as a probable human carcinogens. And the DDT was uh, banned in 1972. And yet we have a whole history of, of DDT after 1972. What happened was that uh, we banned it in this country, but then the producers continued to produce it and export it all over the world, including Mexico. And then the EPA officials, especially those in Mexico and California, discovered that you could easily get it from Mexico. So they were exporting certain chemicals. They were secretly importing DDT and dumping it all over the land. And this chemical, of course, is one of the organochlorines, and it lasts for several decades in the environment, and it's a neurotoxin. So it causes horrendous uh, effects on wildlife, and uh, we have this legacy now replaced by another series of, of kind of neurotoxin chemicals coming out of Europe, this time the so-called neocortinoids, which have a detrimental effect on wildlife, especially honeybees. So what I, I wrote this article so that I can actually see that there, there's very little change that took place between DDT and glyphosate, which of course came into being in 1974. And by that time, I mentioned that uh, we, EPA was getting at least alert to a tremendous legacy of official corruption. That is the chemical industry itself in concert with um, professional or commercial laboratories, they were think, making things up out of thin air. So they were testing for a number of chemicals and they were giving clean bill of health to chemicals that they were extremely hazardous. And uh, one of my former colleagues, uh, Adrian Gross, discovered a massive laboratory out, outside of Chicago named Industrial Biotest that they were faking all the numbers. And uh, it was just a calamity for the whole the whole idea of environmental protection because it meant that in 1976 when he discovered this, um, this crime, 40%, 40% of all chemicals and drugs that had been come into being, into, that is into trade, into commerce because of some kind of illegal activity on the base on the part of the people who, had, who were owners of these chemicals. 
And EPA was stunned, and uh, they didn't know what to do. And they came up with all sorts of excuses, like we have complementary studies, and don't worry, we're going to ask the chemical industry to repeat these studies. But to repeat a study takes two years, four years. Meanwhile, the product is still on the market, still causing death to honeybees and other wildlife, and probably gets into our food and water. So that uh, it's this legacy of corruption that is still very much alive, and it makes everybody, at least makes me skeptical about anything that I hear which says that, uh, don't worry about it, we're going to take care of it. When Rachel Carson spoke up against the use of DDT and appealed to the powers that be, federal agencies and official science pretended nothing was wrong. So why was that the case? They, they pretended that nothing was wrong because of the political structure of the agency. The EPA came into being by an executive order, and it was signed, it came into being by President uh, Richard Nixon, a Republican, who at least, I give him credit for at least thinking <laughs> that had, we had to have a central authority to regulate, to do something about the massive industrial pollution coming out of hundreds of factories and thousands of farms and all sorts of other facilities that produce toxins or produce pollution. And uh, the, the people that run our government are politicians. They get elected, they need money, and uh, the, how do you get your money to be elected? To pay for advertisements, you go to the people who have money, and it happen to be most of them industrial corporations. And the best, the most profit of the, of the chemical industry comes from the pesticide section of that industry. So they were seeking money, and uh, in return for that money, they did favors to them. And therefore, they created the EPA as a kind of a lipstick, lipstick service to make it nice that we have something that protects us. But meanwhile, they, they re restricted uh, so that you have EPA in the middle, and then you have on one side the White House, the other side Congress, and the other side the chemical industry. And if you have these outside forces with the uh, control over your budget and over what to do, then the effectiveness, your effectiveness is really very limited. So that uh, you may have the best scientists, and EPA does have good scientists, to come up with all sorts of assessments and risk uh, assessments and other studies that show X chemical causes, Y problem, and so on. But uh, in a sense, the final decision about the use of that chemical does not come from the scientists, it comes from the political appointees. Each president appoints the director or the administrator of the agency and his deputies or her deputies. And it is those guys, men and women, who actually make the decisions for EPA. So that's why. I mean, it's, in other words, when EPA discovered this fraud that I spoke briefly about, the fraud about laboratories, the option was to do what? The option was to shut down the entire chemical industry or to do nothing, and they had to do nothing, and they couldn't do otherwise. Indeed, I remember being at a meeting in the summer of 1980 when we discovered that the White House had ordered EPA to forget about the chemical industry companies but to focus only on the laboratory itself. So EPA focused on that laboratory, and eventually, in 1983, we shut that place down after a lengthy federal trial in Chicago and thousands of pages of testimony and people that worked in that body coming up with all the reality of what they were supposed to be doing and so on, and eventually we shut it down. But in a sense, the process continued because they were, EPA eventually discovered other smaller laboratories all over the country, including California, where they were actually faking, faking things up. And so what do you do? In, the, in, a, in a system that would not have an independent EPA, meaning independent of political influence, and when we don't have a laboratory that you can actually trust, how is it possible then to actually protect human health and the environment? And by the way, there are only a very small percent of all the chemicals in industry that actually even theoretically are tested for effects. Most of the chemicals out there are about supposedly something like 100,000 different chemicals, they are not tested at all because the law, the toxic, uh, the law says that you can regulate a chemical only if you discover that it has nasty effects. And who's going to give you the nasty effects? Not exactly the owner. So the government is trying to find out 
Does that uh, asbestos, let's say, benzene, cause human health effects? And then they start in a very laborious process of collecting information and suing the company and getting permission from the judge to go ahead and do regulate the chemical and so on. So we need to rethink about all that. I mean, this is the, the rate of disease among humans is, is an epidemic. I mean, you look at cancer, and you have about 45% of Americans either get cancer or die of cancer. <laughs> so you have one in two men or one in three women that are going to actually die from cancer. So what is this? We need to wait until we have 98% of the population afflicted by this disease in order to do something to prevent it? So these are the questions I kept raising while I was there, and I, of course, got into hot water, and they began to say, you are not a team player, and you need to rethink about it, and here is a speech by the director, read it and see what he says, and then follow up on what he says, so to speak. And, but I was certainly quite stubborn. <laughs> I kept thinking my own thoughts. And, you know, I mean, I, I had a doctor's degree. I had written a book already, and I knew how to do research. So I did my own research, and everything I ever wrote, ever written in a, in a memorandum, I was always well documented with footnotes, with sources. So they couldn't argue on that basis, but they, they, my, they certainly made my life miserable. So in the current day, regarding neonicotinoids, all of this talk about how they're going to move forward and have these task force to investigate what can be done to protect not only the bees, but other pollinators. What is that about? So is this just another case of smoke and mirrors? Well, I mean, I already uh, read about it at the White House uh, task force on neonicotinoids eventually gave in, caved in, and they did nothing fundamentally. So the neonicotinoids are doing uh, just as good as yesterday or the day before. They, I don't know why they, they hesitate to take action, considering that honeybees are not just uh, a lovely ancient insect that with which humans have made their lives for millennia. I mean, we have Aristotle, who lived two and a half thousand years ago. He wrote about honeybees. And so on. And, uh, but cannabis are very important because of the pollination they do. And according to what I read from the experts, they pollinate about 90 crops or more. And the benefit, the financial benefit, is over $25 billion per year. And we would lose a third of the, what we eat if we completely wiped out the cannabis. So consider this cost, if not, even forget about the philosophical importance of all this natural world and so on, but just the strictly economic stuff. Why? in the name of whatever these people believe, want to kill the honeybees. That's what completely, you know, just completely makes me very unhappy. And I, in fact, in my book, I wrote a whole chapter about honeybees because of the, you know, it tells you a lot. How do you treat honeybees? It tells you how they're going to treat you, <laughs> and how they're going to treat larger animals. So I remember talking to a woman from uh, Arizona, and she was the, the president of the Beekeepers Association of, of Arizona, and she was telling me about all this. He used to send lengthy letters to every member of the delegation from Arizona, including the congressional chairpersons of all committees that had to do with agriculture. And she would uh, send me a copy as well. And she would point out to, in great detail about the benefits of the honeybees. And I kept talking to her, and she kept talking to me, and I said to her, well, how, come, how do you survive? She said, the reason they have not bombed, and I'm using the, the literary, bomb my honeybees is because my honeybees are about 100 miles away from any for the nearest farm operation. So the farmers were threatening with complete destruction of any beekeeper that spoke up. So they had this kind of fear, agreement of fear, more or less, that regulated the, the political economy of farmers and beekeepers in Arizona, at least, and probably for the rest of the country. Maybe Tom is much more qualified to talk about this, how the system works and or does not fail to work, and they have this kind of death rate continue against these uh, very useful honey honeybees. Yes, I think uh, the beekeeping industry is just barely hanging on. I wanted to ask uh, a couple of questions 
I've been a small scale commercial beekeeper for 40 years, and I've had to deal with these chemical issues from the very beginning. The uh, the chemical problems, the DDT problems, have played out over the course of my life. As a child, I can recall them coming through the neighborhoods with the fogging trucks, and we were assured that it was safe. My my question is that I'm struck by the strong parallels in your article and in your book, Poison Spring, to to what we see today. And if there's been any change, the change has been for the worse. Now, maybe this isn't a fair question, but I would ask you, based on your background and your experience, do you see any way that we can begin to break this loggerhead? Because we're headed for disaster, in my view. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the the situation seems to be sometimes hopeless, but there is always hope. And the hope comes, for instance, from these young mothers that have discovered poisons in their breast milk. If those women, young women, get together and they talk to each other and they find out a common disaster or tragedy, then they could change the country. They have, you know, they bring forth life and they are very passionate about the safety and the health of their children. So we just need to get those people together. And I cannot understand why environmental organizations, for instance, who should know what you and I know, have not thought about this very sick. Put the money down and get these women together. Give them to, for instance, let them read my book. <laughs> I sound selfish right now, but I think they should read that book like that because it's the only book in existence that, that completely summarizes the connections between government and industry and why this corruption is actually killing us. So yes, I think every, to, everybody should read your book. Absolutely. I mean, I, I know it sounds awful for me to say that, but I think it is true. They, they need to read either my book or somebody else's book. At any rate, they need to read this book to find out why the system is rotten, why it's going on right now, so they can, without knowledge, you know, the saying is that knowledge is power. Without knowledge, they can begin to ask questions, and they begin to demand things, not just beg or petition. They need to surround the capital of every, every nation, every country, I mean, every state, and to demand that politicians get off and do something about it, or they are going to themselves do it. This is, this is the problem. Apathy is killing this country. Apathy. I mean, why people go, take care, I mean, take all these horror stories. Is it because they don't know or because they know but they are afraid? I don't know what is the answer. But those young women, I think they ought to be on the leadership and get together and begin to demand that they ban neonicotinoids, they ban most of those chemicals. We don't need them. The problem that we're seeing, Dr. Valianiotis, is that there is a lot of propaganda that's being spun by industry in support of keeping neonicotinoids on the market. We're seeing everything from how neonicotinoids are good for bees to the shift to the blame for the the decline of pollinators to other problems. Tom, can you share with our listeners once again what the actual definition of colony collapse is? Well, colony collapse is something that was created, grasped upon by industry to become the great mystery that was going to be this black hole where all the research dollars and years of research was going to go. And certainly... uh, colony collapse occurs, but it's just one of many symptoms of these neonicotinoids. We've been talking about DDT and glyphosate, but I think it's important before we close to to recognize that the neonicotinoids are immeasurably worse than DDT. It appears that the toxic equivalent of 400 billion pounds of DDT is being put down on the earth in North America every year in the form of these neonicotinoids. 400 billion pounds of toxic equivalent. It's beyond comprehension, and we have to do something to break this stranglehold that industry has on the regulators, the USDA, and our form of government. I was listening to a commentator a week ago who said, we don't have representatives. We don't have a Congress. What we have are 535 contractors for industry. (laughs) 
he's right. He's right. These people are contractors, absolutely. I mean, but I, I, I still say we need to get those women effective because they are the solution because of the what they do in life. They give birth to life, and they are much more passionate about this than perhaps you and I. So they need to get informed first of all, and then get together. Maybe form a political party so they can begin to elect themselves into office. So we get rid of these corrupt people that so apathetic and on the pay of these companies. That's what we need. In other words, we need democracy. That's what it is. It's a kind of a democratic transition from this kind of oligarchy of the money to, to real democracy, which is, you know, defending of us and the natural, the natural world. I mean, if cannabis die and birds die, you do, you're not far behind. It's, it doesn't take a PhD to figure that out. We have tons of studies. We know this is what's going on. And by the way, the climate change, the so-called global warming, is nothing but another effect of this gigantic industrial system we have, especially that of agriculture. About 50% of CO2 and methane come from agriculture, industrial agriculture. So as I tell my colleagues here when I speak, I say we have to break up the system to create again, to go back to small-scale family farming. And therefore, everything will begin to fit into place, and we ban these chemicals. We don't need them. Dr. Valianonis, you've made some excellent points. You know, it would be great if we could start a whole new political party, but unfortunately, it takes a lot of money, and with the relationships that some of the people that are running for president have, it's a very, very competitive race. Yeah, but we have many of these young women, no doubt, that daughters and wives of very wealthy people. I mean, I was teaching at this college, and my students were paying $60,000 tuition. So they are the sons and daughters of the very, very the people that rule you. So what I'm saying is that, yes, money, you need money, but you need to pass this information to these young women. They probably don't know what's going on. That's why they're doing nothing. So I agree with you, but as Tom frequently says, we're dealing with... You want to finish my sentence, Tom? Organized crime. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think the only reason much of this isn't criminal is because they construct the, the, the system, the regulations, to provide for the crimes so that they, they aren't criminal. But th these, this is criminal conduct. Enormous human tragedy being inflicted on people here. I agree. I mean, this is... So we need to change it. I mean, this kind of talk we have, it's interesting. I hope it reaches many, many people, maybe millions. <laughs> and get, you know, get those women together. I think this is one of the most important things we can do is to get to those women who are having children to know what's going on. And the evidence to that is let them test their breast milk. And they immediately will get absolutely furious about what they're going to discover in their breast milk. Well, one thing that hasn't been given much discussion is the consequences of these neonicotinoids. They've been presented as uh, relatively harmless, again, harmless, to mammals because the target synapses, the insects have a great many and mammals have relatively few. But the evidence is that it's, the effect is cumulative and irreversible, which leads to the question if if the latency for an insect is a matter of minutes, hours, weeks, or days, depending on how it's administered, what's the latency for human beings? Are we going to be telling our children and grandchildren 10 or 15 years from now that the corn rootworm was more important than their health? I see no examination of that question, and, and just as with DDT, we're assured that this is safe for people. It is not safe. Absolutely we need to put not. some and of these people behind bars. Absolutely, I agree with you. And look at the, the disease, the, the diseases that afflict little children, from aggression to incompetence to slow learning to not be able to learn. All these things are related to the central nervous system and the brain. And we know these neurotoxins and neonicotinoids included in that, they cause these effects on the central nervous system and the brain. So what are we, we want to create a dummy and a society of ignorant people, of literate people that cannot be educated? And this is what we would be getting if we continue with this, this kind of barrage of dumping all these extremely potent chemicals into the air, water, and food that we eat. So we need to get rid of them. <laughs> That's my, the, the net effect is you cannot continue with just slight reform. You need to get rid of this stuff. 
The evidence is already there. We don't need to move more studies and more studies and more studies. Enough is enough. I <laughs> well, Dr. Valianatis, I wanted to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been very enlightening and also it's great to have someone like you out there speaking up about these things especially from a place where you've worked with these folks you know what the facts are you have the documents to prove it thank you very much it's been a pleasure and folks thank you for tuning in this has been june Stoyer with the organic view radio show tune in next week as tom and i continue exploring the world of neonicotinoids